Hello. Um, I'd like to talk today about a project which I've been working on for some time and which is almost complete. It looks at the impact of violence on conscript soldiers between the revolutionary Napoleonic Wars and the First World War, and indeed its aftermath. The study shows how German subject lives were turned upside down by war. The sights, smells and privations of modern warfare affected millions of combatants and civilians in 1866, 1870 to 71, and 1914 to 18, shocking contemporaries and altering their understanding of military conflict, the state system, and even politics. Such revelations about the real nature of warfare eventually overturned romantic or national conceptions of war and the military, which had become commonplace in the 19th century since the Napoleonic Wars. Since conflicts appeared likely and posed an existential threat to individuals, and it seemed to state, they continued to play an important part in political debates and public imaginaries. How they were imagined depended to a large degree on subjects' own experiences of war, with long-lasting assumptions about and images of military conflict changing pronouncedly in the years after 1870 and 1914, rather than as a consequence of colonial wars, sporadic reportage of conflicts abroad, or domestic discussions of the military. The notion of war as a cultural and political caesura has been widely challenged. For scholars such as Modris Eckstein's, the First World War constituted uh, the birth of a modern age in which, and I quote, life and art have blended, in which existence has become aestheticized, and which turned rebellion against the hated bourgeois into a matter no longer of individuals or even one nation, but uh, of an entire generation, as the urge to create and the urge to destroy changed places, evading politics. Many historians have been more cautious in the investigation of cause and effect. The precise delineation of the caesura character and the societal effects of the soldiers' wartime experiences during the First World War is confronted by considerable methodological and empirical problems, writes Benjamin Seaman. The question of possible cross-cutting effects between the mass experience of physical violence in modern industrial societies and general cultural and social transformation has not been answered, partly because of the absence of a change of method or interest among contemporary exponents of those human sciences, such as sociology and history, which could have contributed to an attentive and thoughtful consideration of these processes, end of quotation. The implementation, mediation, and scope of military violence and its effects, both violent and non-violent, were not given systematic attention in the modernization theories of the social sciences, leaving the investigation of soldiers' wartime experiences to literary critics such as Paul Fussell. Fussell, of course, had also written on the Second World War in a similar vein. Such scholars starting point, according to Tiemann, is um, the idea that the shaping of an entire age cohort of men by their impressions of the trenches became the catalyst of an abrupt and profound change um, of mentality and consciousness, a change that had enduring effect beyond the immediately affected group of fighters at the front on the political culture and the forms of symbolic self-understanding of the societies affected. Social historians such as Tiemann, Wolfgang Kruse, Wolfram Wetter attempted to focus on continuities with working class and rural conscripts refusing to view experience of the front as a deep caesura and with the liberal and conservative social milieu of the nationalist camp creating, and I quote, a nationally loaded political myth for their own purposes. The treatment of the physical violence and mass death of the First World War functioned as a field of cultural conflict in the interwar era, rather than as an experiential historical rupture in its own right, as soldiers' experiences of the front were adapted to the most diverse political and cultural discourses of post-war society. Memories and post-war political conflicts on this reading were more significant in changing the ways in which war was perceived then were soldiers and civilians' experiences 
in the dual sense of immediate sensory impressions or Erlebnisse and those impressions to which individuals pay attention through a process of interpretation over the medium or even longer term uh, Erfahrungen. Since no great wave of enthusiasm carried such soldiers into battle, even in the first weeks and months of a conflict, it's necessary to work out how they endured years of fighting in the trenches of the Western Front and in the freezing temperatures of the Eastern Front. Permanent and temporary exits were available uh, from the trenches, with soldiers able to report sick, desert, or if with like-minded uh, comrades, mutiny or strike, writes Alexander Watson. Others found refuge from the front in psychiatric wounds or suicide, yet given the extreme demands of front service and the long duration of the war, surprisingly few soldiers took advantage of these exits. A mixture of patriotic defence, underpinned by a fear of the consequences of defeat for themselves and their families, and obedience to the legitimate authority of the military, identification with their comrades and countrymen, distrust of the enemy, and the innate tendency of men to interpret information in accordance with pre-existing beliefs, all in Watson's view, explain why men fought for so long. Many combatants, uh, uh, many combatants narrow, uh, horizon of expectations was of central importance to an understanding of their responses to military conflict, claims Chiman. Those soldiers soon came to the conclusion that the war would drag on for a long time. A new turn of events could always provide grounds for hope, with almost everyone investing such hopes in offensives and peace efforts, while individual soldiers focused on their unit's postings and assignments and periods of leave. Even frontline soldiers were by no means under constant strain, permanently subject to the extreme exertions typical of the famous battles of Materiel from 1916 on, which have dominated historical memory, end of quotation. Religious belief, the rotation of units on the fighting front, comradeship, a sense of duty and support from home sustained the majority of soldiers through the war and ensured that they fell back on the traditional sources of stability within rural society and indeed within large cities and working class milieu when they returned home. The vast majority of soldiers, including those in large cities, were able, esteem, uh, uh, sorry, were able to put their war experiences behind them, find employment, settle back or, uh, into or establish their families and adjust to daily life, concludes Richard Bessel in his study of demobilization. Historians have been keen to qualify and correct the notion of a disillusioned or maladjusted war generation or front generation unfit for civilian life. The literature on the soldiers of the wars of unification is much patchier than that on the First or Second World War, but it too concentrates on the coping mechanisms and suppressed suffering of combatants, together with the simultaneous mythologizing of a national war. The majority of the one million German soldiers who came to France between July 1870 and March 1871 experienced a military conflict of this type for the first time, writes Frank Becker. Yet the range of interpretations formulated by journalists and the field post of troops on the fighting front became enmeshed. What appeared in newspapers shaped the perception of the soldiers, and the perception of the soldiers exercised in turn an influence on the newspapers, so that it's not surprising that the interpretations articulated in different media were similar to one another, and that this similarity extended to the ego documents of the soldiers, concludes Becker. The belief that the war against France was won by traditional ruling elites and the nation together structured the perception of military events in the bourgeois public sphere, both during and after 1870 to 71, or at least this is Becker's contention. In contrast, in 1870 to 71, to the wars of 1864 and 1866, which were, I quote, still commented on by contemporaries in a very contradictory fashion. 
The campaigns of the Franco-German War seem to have furnished the proof, and most commentators were united in this, that the Prussian-German army possessed the best possible organizational structure. Against the background of a series of national military victories, during which the self-understanding of contemporaries and their image of their opponent changed as a result of the concrete events of the war, combatants were reluctant to hinder or challenge the war effort, writes uh, Heidi Merkens. A limited number of historians have pointed out that the contemporaneous portrayal of the war of 1870 to 71 was not at all the same as retrospective accounts. These same historians, though, have nonetheless tended to underline the suffering conformity of soldiers who usually stressed that they judged their participation in the war as a valuable experience, which they would not have liked to have missed. Although soldiers often complained that they'd suffered from witnessing the horrors of war, only a few of them overtly described what they had had to endure, writes Christina Kruger. Soldiers' letters followed certain patterns and conventions of writing, characterized in Isaac Sikorsky's overstated formulation, not by information, veracity, clarity, and distinctness, but by, and I quote, <coughs> sorry, misinformation, lies, irrelevance, obscurity, and indistinctness, with competence obeying an inner censorship and carefully avoiding any matter that might have caused too much worry to their loved ones at home. <clears throat> Apart from occasional passages of war novels and memoirs of combatants, descriptions of the horror of war are rare, Kruger concludes. Soldiers and veterans put up with the sights, smells and hardship of war, um, doing little to contradict public remembrance of the triumph of the German army and the foundation of the national state, as the dead were celebrated as heroes and their death was justified as an exemplary sacrifice for the national cause. There are reasons to doubt this version of events. From the available evidence, it appears that a significant number of combatants described what they had seen and they wrote of their own suffering in 1870 to 71. During the First World War, the willingness of ordinary soldiers to disclose the realities of modern warfare increased, not least because of the longer duration of the conflict and the expanding volume of posts passing between the fighting and home front. There are now billions of letters passing between one and the other. The main question here hinges on the interpretation and evaluation of such statements, for war was unlikely to have produced a single shock or trauma affecting millions of soldiers in the same way. In, Rein, in Reinhard Koselik's view, it's unlikely that a common war, either the First or the Second World War, would be experienced in common. Combatants were affected by a multitude of individual sensations or elibnisse, structures of events, for example, the experience of trench warfare or of aerial war. Um, and numerous socializing conditions, such as communities of language, religious certainties, or ideological conceptions. Any transformation of consciousness brought about by war would, and I quote, take place with different ramifications on all levels at the same time, and would depend on historically selective processes of recollection and memorialization, textual dissemination and reception, public debate and symbolism in accordance with the social interests and political imperatives of the post-war era. Nevertheless, Kozelik proposes, all social predispositions were altered by the events of war to the extent that widespread horror at the destruction and death of 1914 to 18 precluded enthusiasm in 1939, creating a profound shift of consciousness and overcoming the countervailing forces of nationalism. In Klaus Latzel's uh, words, if the linkages between individuals' immediate impressions or Leibniser and their ability to make sense of the world or Zinstiftung are insufficient, the same individuals' patterns of meaning and ways of making sense of the world can, and I quote, be extended, modified, and adapted to external challenges. 
Basque language plays an important part in this process, making possible defining and limiting experiences, providing types and structures of meaning and storing social knowledge. Experiences are made by individuals, yet they are not individual, writes Latzel, which is of significance for the question of the generalization of personal testimony. The, connect the connections between Erlebnis and Sinnstiftung are more easily maintained and modified when, and I quote, they do not extend beyond previously sedimented experiences or Erfahrungen. Kriegserfahrungen, by contrast, are difficult to make sense of because, the, and I quote, the dimensions of what is experienced, especially the dimensions of violence and death, overstretch the capacities of the individual and social economy of experiences, end of quotation. In these conditions, it seems possible that individuals' experiences could diverge and fragment, making them hard to interpret. Fragmentation of experience, repression of shocking sensations, and instances of self-delusion render the testimony issuing from soldiers' menaced and precarious egos deeply, deeply problematic for historians as evidence. The distinction between history and fiction is often hazy in combatants' accounts. Facts are frequently mistaken, and there is, in the verdict of Rudyard Kipling, who was trying to reconstruct his son's death, um, uh, 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 after well, his son had died at the Battle of Luz, um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, in these circumstances, there is large room for error because of combatants' limited field of view, the chaos and anonymity of the battlefield, and the stress and shock of conflict, which dislocates memory. As Robert Graves put it. <clears throat> it's practically impossible, as well as forbidden, to keep a diary. Great latitude should therefore be allowed to a soldier who's since got his facts or dates mixed up. I would even paradoxically say that the memoirs of a man who went through some of the worst experiences of trench warfare are not truthful if they do not contain a high proportion of falsities. High explosive barrages will make a temporary liar or visionary of anyone. In many combatants' writings on the First World War, what mattered was to do justice to the feelings and the psychological transformation of the soldier. War seemed to have altered the way contemporaries viewed the world, but it was itself subsequently seen through the same distorting lens. Histories of soldiers' experiences, as Latzel indicates, rest on the interpretation of overlapping sets of conditions, events, actions, impressions, mentalities, beliefs, assumptions, and emotions. In wars, when the drills and rules of the military appeared ill-suited to changing sets of conditions, and the sensibilities and mores of peacetime seemed to have been trampled on, combatants and civilians' feelings assumed an unusual prominence in supposedly civilized or cultured societies. To Norman Elias, whose thesis about a civilizing process and pacification had been published in 1939, the appearance of anxiety-inducing tensions within and around us had the potential to transform reasonable conduct with its high degree of affect control and to cause it to crumble or collapse, giving rise to collective longings and fears. If war created an historical caesura, it was likely to be closely connected to emotions as Lucien Febvre suggested in his call for scholars to pay attention to, and I quote, sensibility and history in 1941, after he witnessed the glorification of basic feelings running out of control during the Second World War, and turning the world into, and I quote, a stinking pit of corpses. Modern warfare, it seemed, produced fear. For commentators on shell shock in the First World War, the technology of long distance killing with its emphasis on anonymous agency and random aggression placed an unbearable strain on men's physiological inheritance, writes Joanna Burke. Yet how did fears, which according to most observers refer to an immediate objective threat, metamorphose into anxieties, which refer to an anticipated subjective threat and which can exi exist as a more generalized state, overwhelming subjects from within, for a much longer period of time. 
even though states of fear and anxiety are indistinct, since what's an immediate and objective threat for one group may simply be an anticipated and subject threat, subjective threat for another group, with a difference between fear and anxiety oscillating wildly over time in the negotiation between the individual and the group, the problem of the durability of emotional states remains. One of the defining characteristics of feelings, after all, is that they're fleeting and unstable or ephemeral in Uta Flavert's uh, book title. Differing in accordance with age, history, and culture. <clears throat> Another uh, characteristic is that they're invisible. We can identify publicly choreographed panic reactions during theater fires or when attacked in the street at night. Um, but how do we know what individuals really felt? Historians only have access to descriptions of inner states and outward expressions of emotion, together with other things which contemporaries have left behind. The minority of German soldiers, 613,047 of the 13.1 million uh, men who served in the German army in the First World War, and 316 out of the 1.5 million uh, men who were mobilized in 1870-71, were labeled as psychiatric cases. Although for the numerous psychologically ill war neurotics, the traumatic experiences a Leibniz could bring in their wake long-term effects, concedes Seaman, their treatment and thematization did not lead to recognizable social patterns or comprehensive public attention, but took place instead, largely within the parameters of a medical and psychiatric debate of specialists. End of quotation. The very notion of trauma was, as Paul Lerner has noted, increasingly fraught during the war and became a highly contentious category in the 1920s. On this basis, it seems plausible to regard the grave individual psychological burdens and consequences of participation in the war as marginal in the, discuss in the discussion of an historical caesura in 1914 to 18. It would be unwise to, to rush to this conclusion, however, um, not least because the classification and diagnosis of war neuroses remained controversial after being put forward for the first time in the 1880s. Against this background, the fact that up to 4.6% of soldiers in the German army during the First World War were referred to as psychiatric cases is striking. More importantly, there's much evidence to suggest that millions more were affected psychologically and emotionally without receiving treatment. The feeling of fear which combatants reported was mixed as a simple emotion with complex ones such as honor, shame, disgust and horror, all of which are historically and culturally specific. The feeling was also corporeal, of course, provoking physical effects such as rapid or arrested breathing and beating of the heart, high blood pressure, adrenaline, diarrhea, stomach cramps, and incapacitating illnesses. How could such immediate physical reactions and emotional states have long-term ramifications? Fear, anxiety, and mourning were expected by psychologists to diminish or disappear. The few cases where this did not occur were labeled pathological. The boundary between strong emotions and pathology seems in historical cases of combat to be permeable. Much of our current understanding of the psychological effects of combat derives from the studies of PTSD. The term post-traumatic stress disorder was first included in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association in 1980, but it referred to symptoms that had been described earlier under the heading of combat stress, trauma, shell shock, or war, neurosis, or psychosis, as the first cases in 1870 to 71 were labeled. The diagnostic criteria of the DSM related to someone who had, and I quote, experienced an event that is outside the range of usual human experience and that would be markedly distressing to almost anyone. 
The traumatic event had to be re-experienced in the form of recurrent and intrusive distressing recollections of the event, recurrent distressing dreams of the event, sudden acting or feeling as if the traumatic event were recurring, uh, including hallucinations, flashback episodes, and reliving the experience. Or intense psychological distress at exposure to events that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the traumatic event. It was also typical to avoid stimuli associated with the trauma or numbing of general responsiveness indicated by efforts to avoid thoughts or feelings associated with the trauma. In some cases, symptoms of increased arousal could be present, such as insomnia, irritability, or outbursts of anger, difficulty concentrating, hypervigilance, and an exaggerated startler response. The identification and definition of these symptoms, the traumatic event, and the disorder itself are contested. Nonetheless, they present significant challenges to the way in which memory and emotions have been understood, begging the question whether conscious acts of remembrance and recollection are different from automatic relived experiences, and whether sets of strong feelings, rather than pathological responses, can be remembered and relived over the longer term. The psychological study of combat breakdown hints at wider long-term effects of the exposure or of soldiers' exposure to the conditions of modern warfare. At the time, the ascendant view was that the war traumatized veteran was weak and selfish, which was one of the reasons why Germany lost the war and which was likely to bankrupt the state unless checked, writes Simon Wesley. For German psychiatry, he goes on, Shell shock was a moral matter with recognition of psychiatric breakdown anticipated to lead to financial burdens, which would increase the number of pensions that the state had to pay out and military difficulties, which would affect recruitment. After the Second World War, Edward Schill's and Maurice Janowitz's sociological analysis of cohesion and disintegration in the Wehrmacht was influential and added to the prior case about uh, trauma and its absence. Um, what Schulz and Janowitz argue, as is well known, uh, uh, and they argue in a similar fashion to other similar studies of the US Army during the Second World War, uh, that soldiers, in this case Wehrmacht soldiers, have been motivated by primary group loyalty. They fight, uh, right, Schulz and Janowitz, because they've been trained to fight and because failure to do so endangers not just their own lives, but also those of the people immediately around them with whom they've formed powerful social bonds, end of quotation. In the German case, such research challenged the view that ideology explained why soldiers fought and stopped fighting. As Wesley points out, the two sociologists do accept the role ideology played amongst what they call the hardcore national socialists, but they estimate the latter accounted for no more than 10 to 15% of fighting forces, mainly junior officers. For the most part, argue Schulz and Janowitz, Wehrmacht soldiers stopped fighting when the primary group failed them. Either because they were social misfits and never accepted by the primary group, because they belonged to out groups or they'd been sanctioned by the primary group usually after some token or carefully scripted ritual of resistance to satisfy group honor before surrender. The discovery of PTSD was not the first acceptance of the psychiatric cost of war and trauma, but it altered the interpretation of why, uh, which had been put forward by Schulz and Janowitz, and which in turn affected the probable duration of the disorder, as Wesley notes. Until then, it was assumed that if you broke down in battle and the cause was indeed the stress of war, then your illness would be short lived. Whereas now, after PTSD, breakdown in battle is seen as a predictable consequence of overwhelming fear and anxiety, resulting from the inevitable and deleterious consequences of adversity magnified in the setting of industrialized warfare and the modern industrial state. According to Nigel Hunt and Ian Robbins, the persistence of psychological effects of combat was understood differently after the Second World War. 
with some authors reporting new cases years after 1945 as the beginning of a recognition that traumatic war experiences can lead to long-term or perhaps permanent difficulties. Hunt and Robbins ask what, is it, what it is about traumatic memories of, or experiences that, and I quote, means individuals can live for years without apparent difficulty only to experience a re-emergence in later life, end of quotation. Typically, returning soldiers refrained from talking about the war, even, the, uh, even though the act of writing could be cathartic. Comradeship in this context provided a means of talking about the war after the event, especially when opportunities to discuss wartime experiences with wives and families were limited. Veterans' memories uh, seem to have been constructed spatially and historically on the basis of what they already knew, with the ways in which they conceived of the world affecting how memories are stored, the likelihood of events being remembered at all, and how they're remembered. Um, the term traumatic memory was formulated in the late 19th century in order to suggest that a severe shock can cause a partial disintegration of the person's capacity to synthesize sensory impressions into a conscious whole. Since then, psychologists have heeded or coincided with Sigmund Freud's proposition that traumatic memories exist outside consciousness, but can subsequently enter into consciousness. For their part, Hunt and Robbins distinguish between implicit, implicit memory, which is nonverbal uh, and out of conscious control, and to whose content we do not have direct access, and explicit memory, which is verbal and under conscious control, with ready access to things which we can discuss, think about, and perhaps even change. Memories are normally coded and stored in explicit verbal memory from which they can be recalled voluntarily. Since recollections of traumatic events disrupt the processing of memory, they exist as unconscious dissociated memories, which may later emerge into consciousness through reminders, the effects of which may not be under conscious control. Whereas normal memories can be recalled into consciousness with greater or less ease, with greater or lesser detail, Traumatic memories are activated involuntarily and automatically by a reminder such as guns firing or a flash of light uh, so that the so that individual acts sorry, sorry so that the individual acts and feels exactly the same as in the original trauma. Some soldiers were affected gravely by such memories, ceasing to function, while others coped with less debilitating memories in silence. The scope and meaning of trauma still disputed, not least because the supposed causal connections to a physical uh, or psychological event proved difficult to establish beyond doubt. The principal US study of the effects of the Vietnam War commissioned by Congress in 1983 concluded in 1988 that 479,000 men of the, the 3.14 million who served uh, in Vietnam still had PTSD and just under a million uh, combatants and others had had full-blown full PTSD uh, in total, even though only 300,000 of these had actually experienced combat. Many were deemed to be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder without having experienced an obvious traumatic event. By the same token, many who had experienced trauma did not develop the disorder, as two experts put it in 1995, PTSD is not an inevitable consequence of trauma. What such studies show is that there is a broad panoply of symptoms and medical histories, ranging from untreatable psychoses to mild depression, which the DSM defined as an emotional disturbance brought about by a congenital predisposition or a negative external event. The precise relationship between trauma and emotions is rarely made explicit, explicit. Nevertheless, an historical economy of emotions still seems relevant with close, if obscure, connections between an individual's feelings, horror, disgust, fear, anxiety, shame, honor, and pride, for instance, and those of others. Some people appear to lose the ability to experience certain emotions as a consequence of trauma in a physical sense, for example, as a result of a brain lesion, or as a, a consequence of a trauma in a psychological sense, 
where they experience something, and I quote, um, as a crucial event in their life, something that happened to them, that was done to them, with which they could not adequately cope, and which might be associated with a blockage of feelings connected to the event and its memory, in the words of Ulta Freyberg. Yet even in these cases, it's usually not the whole emotional system that is impaired and distorted, leaving a complex set of feelings in place. What I want to do um, is study these broad sets of feelings. The findings of US surveys after the First and Second World Wars suggest that there was a range of responses to modern warfare, with many veterans expressing strong feelings about what they'd experienced, but without suffering a breakdown, either a war neurosis or psychosis. The unspecific sense that all was not right with the spirit of the men who came back, something was wrong in the appraisal of the British war reporter, Philip Gibbs in 1919, was widely shared. They put on civilian clothes again and looked to their mothers and wives very much like the young men who'd gone to the business in the peaceful days before August 1914. But they'd not come back the same men. Something had altered in them. They were subject to sudden moods and queer tempers, fits of profound depression, alternating with a restless desire for pleasure. Many were easily moved to passion where they lost control of themselves. Many were bitter in their speech violent in opinion, frightening. One survey of almost 900 former patients by the Veterans Administration in the United States after the Second World War, which was published in 1951, concluded that most continue to display symptoms of disturbance, notwithstanding the fact that 67% had made, and I quote, a satisfactory occupational adjustment and a satisfactory family adjustment after fighting. Yet only, according to the same report, only 56% were said to have socially acceptable behaviour and mores. The most important factors in promoting a good readjustment were, in the words of the uh, report, a warm, tolerant, helpful attitude on the part of a wife or other family member, satisfactory work situation and success in school and social contact. Even in these circumstances, though, a majority of ex-soldiers showed signs of psychological disturbance. Similar reactions can be found in post-war Germany without corresponding levels of official and public recognition. Here, the distinction between repression, suppression, discouragement, revision, and relocation of memories and stories about the war is particularly hazy. Many veterans of the wars of unification in the First World War claimed that they would never forget what they'd witnessed. Michael Roper recalls the case of Harry Patch, one of the last survivors of the Great War, interviewed by the BBC in 2003, who, talk, who talked for the first time after almost 90 years of silence about a wounded soldier that he'd stumbled across as he went over the top, Hilcombe Ridge in 1917. I was with him in his last seconds of life as he let out a final cry of mother, the veteran recalled. From that day until today, now nearly 106 years old, she'll always remember that cry and she'll always remember that death is not the end. And he'd always remember the soldier's injuries, his chest and stomach, all torn to pieces by shrapnel. Millions of soldiers in the First World War had seen similar things. It's possible that their experiences had a long-term effect, making them more brittle and more prone to the use of violence. The problem with approaches that stress the ties between loved ones and downplay the extent to which the war brutalized men is that they tend to restrict themselves to the war experiences when families were separated and men were prone to homesick longings, rarely investigating in detail the family situations that these men left or the ones they returned to after they were demobilized, Roper contends. Even among mature adults, the idea that violence could be forgotten seems improbable. But for those who were unmarried and mere youths when they signed up, soldiers like George Coppard, who'd had the brains of a best friend splattered over his tunic, trousers and breakfast, it's untenable, end of quotation. The challenge facing Roper 
which Seaman and Latzel have already outlined, is to establish the representativeness and significance of such experiences. How can historians establish whether there were common experiences of war closely linked to similar constellations of emotions and likely to be reactivated in certain circumstances? What relationship existed between contemporaries' experiences and feelings, their reference to cultural symbols, and their political attitudes and outlook over the longer term? For Seaman, the debates about the effects of soldiers' exposure to violence and about normality and extremes have been known for a long time in public commentary and in the historiography who in Germany was still normal, was still a normal person during and after the eruption of physical violence and destruction of material things in the years 1914 to 18 and 1939 to 1945, he asks. And even if one wanted to put this to one side, by what yardstick could such normality have been measured? At the same time, however, how can historians prove an older thesis about a direct mass psychological or mental causal relationship um, between the experience of violence uh, in war and acts of violence in the post-war years for positing instead that many acts were spontaneous to be set within a logic of action in local and regional case studies and emphasizing the careful and exact description of acts of violence that actually took place in order to come as, to as close as possible and understanding what the actors uh, actually meant and to understand their repetitive patterns of action has also been Seaman's project. Seaman concedes that further analysis of brutalization is required in order to judge whether participants in the war were themselves brutalized and whether the violence they suffered and perpetrated during the conflict was directly related to violent tendencies in German society post-1918. But his preliminary conclusion is that, and I quote, all in all, it appears unlikely that the experience of war resulted in extensive brutalization amongst German soldiers. From the late 1920s onwards, popular war novels and films did play a major role in importing nationalist mythologies into the milieu of the socialist working class, but they failed to overcome the polarization of Weimar Germany into political subcultures, which were defined to a significant extent by different confrontational, not integrative attitudes to the war. So post-war um, history uh, was more important than soldiers' experiences during the war. And these histories were filtered through uh, political milieu. In my work on this subject, I try to show how soldiers were more likely, as contemporary observers like Gibbs and Virginia Woolf intimated, to become brittle rather than brutal. Their feelings and experiences of the war remain critical, however, for the redefinition of politics and culture in the post-war eras. Because the German Empire and the Weimar Republic were both the products of war, and in the case of Weimar, products of the peace, the legitimacy of the new political order depended on citizens' understanding of recent events. There were many reasons for the public to support official narratives, including arguments about national defense and self-preservation, acceptance of military service, fascination with the army and navy, a long-standing heroic mythology of war, a desire to make the deaths of soldiers worthwhile and to ease the suffering of mourning families. Yet in both the wars of unification and in the First World War, combatants' expectations of military conflict had clashed with the realities of modern warfare, leaving many with a set of experiences, stories, memories and emotions which were difficult to reconcile with public reports, histories and commemorations of war. Since soldiers' descriptions of the horror of military campaigns were widely known, can be seen here in 1866, through private correspondence from the field and the publication and press serialization of memoirs, the duality or at least contradictions of different accounts of past and future wars, ranging from disgust and fatalism to pride and heroism, proved to be an unpredictable element in the politics of the Kaiserreich and the Republic. 
combatants and civilians, private remembering and official and other public rituals of commemoration, which look back to the last military conflict, took place alongside and were entangled in current debates about the role of the military and a swirling, often unarticulated set of fears and hopes about coming wars. Individuals' life worlds, their experiences, assumptions, and everyday practices came face to face with collective actions as they were called up and sent off to the fighting front. Came face to face with collective, frequently fractured discussion of war in the press and elsewhere. My current research investigates the intersection of these worlds, not merely in a semantic or hermeneutic sense, but in an experiential, active and political one, as citizen soldiers, family members, journalists and politicians backed or challenged decisions for war and peace and interpreted the meaning of life-changing events. The politics of war and peace were not only symbolic, they were precarious and emotionally charged. Thank you.